The high concentrations of sodium ions are present in the extracellular fluid. Sodium leak channels allow sodium ion diffusion into the cell following their concentration gradient. The sodium ions are also pulled inward by their attraction to the negative charges inside the cell membrane. If this inward flow of positive ions continues unopposed, the resting potential eventually disappears. If there were no other factors involved, the membrane potential would eventually reach plus 66 millivolts. Now the chemical gradient driving sodium into the cell is balanced by the electrical gradient pushing sodium out of the cytoplasm. In a resting cell, the transmembrane potential remains stable because the sodium potassium pump uses active transport to remove the accumulating sodium ions. During this process, potassium ions are reclaimed from the extracellular fluid. As we mentioned before, the ion distribution across the membrane maintains a resting membrane potential of minus 70 millivolts. When a stimulus opens ion channels, it disturbs the resting potential of a section of the membrane. This is called the graded potential. Graded potentials result from ion movements called local currents. A graded potential may be strong or weak, depending on the strength of the stimulus. The magnitude of a graded potential decreases rapidly with distance away from the stimulus. As a result, graded potentials aren't useful for carrying information over long distances, such as along an axon innervating skeletal muscle fibers. Long distance information transfer involves the production and propagation of action potentials. To produce an action potential, a stimulus must first produce a graded depolarization to a threshold level. The threshold level of depolarization is similar to the trigger pressure needed to fire a gun. If you press very lightly on the trigger, the gun will not fire. You must exert a certain amount of force on the trigger to activate the firing mechanism. When this threshold level of force is applied, the firing pin drops and a shot is fired. The bullet exits the gun at the same speed no matter how fast or slow the trigger is depressed. The same principles apply to the generation of action potentials. A graded potential is similar to pressure on the trigger and an action potential is similar to the bullet being fired. If the threshold level is reached, an action potential will be transmitted. If the threshold is not reached, the graded potential will disappear when the stimulus is removed. The changes that occur during an action potential at one site start a chain reaction that's propagated along the membrane. That's why action potentials are referred to as all or nothing events. An action potential occurs in the series of steps. The resting membrane has a transmembrane potential of minus 70 millivolts. During the first step, a graded potential changes the permeability of the cell membrane so that more sodium ions enter the cell. If enough sodium ions enter to depolarize the membrane to threshold, voltage-regulated sodium channels open. Sodium ions then flood into the cell, changing the transmembrane potential from minus 70 millivolts to plus 30 millivolts. At this voltage, the sodium gates close and voltage-regulated potassium gates open. Potassium ions flow out following the concentration gradient and they are repelled by the excess of positive charges inside the membrane. As potassium ions exit, the membrane gradually returns to its original voltage level. This repolarization helps restore the normal membrane potential, but the interior of the cell still contains an abnormally high number of sodium ions. The sodium potassium pump restores normal ion concentrations by ejecting the sodium ions and reclaiming lost potassium ions. The voltage regulated sodium channels can't reopen until the membrane potential reaches minus 60 millivolts. The period when the membrane can't generate another action potential is called the absolute refractory period. The membrane can't respond normally to stimulation until the voltage regulated potassium channels close. This process starts at around minus 70 millivolts, and for a brief time, the membrane is hyperpolarized. The time between the end of the absolute refractory period and the return to normal resting conditions is called the relative refractory period. 
The steps we've just reviewed happen in a rather small portion of the total membrane surface, but an action potential affects the entire excitable membrane. In order for this to happen, the action potential is relayed from one membrane segment to another in a series of steps. In each step, the same events are repeated over and over again until the message has been propagated across the entire membrane surface. This is called continuous propagation. But action potentials don't travel at the same speed along all axons. During continuous propagation, a localized action potential spreads across the entire excitable membrane surface in a series of small steps. Action potentials can also be propagated by saltatory propagation. This is when an action potential skips rapidly across the membrane. Saltatory propagation occurs because of the myelin sheath wrapped around the axons of many sensory and motor neurons. In the peripheral nervous system, the myelin sheath is formed by Schwann cells. These cells wrap themselves around the axon fiber in several layers. The small areas between adjacent Schwann cells are called nodes. Nodes are the only points on the axon where action potentials can develop. Elsewhere, the lipids of the myelin sheath act as electrical insulators. This prevents ion movements which are essential to the formation of an action potential. When a signal travels along a myelinated axon, it jumps from node to node. This skipping causes the signal to jump much faster than if it had to be propagated along the entire length of the axon. An action potential is relayed from one neuron to another at junctions called synapses. Neurons also form synapses with effectors, as seen in muscle fibers and gland cells. An example is the cholinergic synapse. A small space called the synaptic cleft separates the two communicating cells. The neuron that transmits the impulse across the synapse is called the presynaptic neuron. The receiving cell is called the postsynaptic neuron. When an action potential reaches the synaptic knob of the presynaptic neuron, the wave of depolarization triggers the opening of voltage-regulated calcium channels. Calcium ions enter the cell and cause synaptic vesicles containing acetylcholine to release their contents into the synaptic cleft, where diffusion carries the acetylcholine toward the postsynaptic cell membrane. From there, the acetylcholine binds to receptor proteins on the postsynaptic membrane. This binding triggers the opening of chemically regulated ion channels, depolarizing the postsynaptic membrane. If this graded potential brings an adjacent area of excitable membrane to threshold, an action potential will occur in the postsynaptic neuron. The effects on the postsynaptic membrane are short-lived because the acetylcholine molecules are broken down by acetylcholine esterase in the postsynaptic cleft or at the postsynaptic membrane. By now you've learned that a single neuron receives signals from thousands of synaptic knobs. Each of these neurons play an important part in the vast network of coordinated cells that comprise your nervous system. Hi, I'm Suzanne Savoy, and I'll be your host for the video tutor discussion of heart function. Every time you have a physical exam, your doctor uses a stethoscope to listen to your heart. We all know that the heartbeat means blood is pumping. But how much more do you really know about how this vital organ works? When you exercise, your body needs more oxygen, so the heart pumps harder and faster to supply oxygenated blood to all your cells and tissues. In this section, we'll explore heart function and then take a closer look at the pathway blood takes through the body. Your heart is constantly at work receiving and pumping a massive amount of blood. First, let's take a look at the interior of the heart. The heart has four chambers. The two thin-walled upper chambers, called atria, collect blood returning to the heart. The lower chambers, with thick muscular walls, 
are called ventricles. The ventricles pump blood to all of the body organs. Membranous flaps, called valves, keep blood flowing in a forward direction. On each side of the heart, an atrioventricular valve prevents backflow between the atrium and ventricle. Semilunar valves prevent backflow between the ventricles and their attached vessels. The heart can be viewed as two separate pumps housed within one organ. The right side of the heart sends blood to the lungs, and the left side sends blood throughout the body. The right atrium receives oxygen-poor blood returning from the body tissues through the superior and inferior vena cava. The right ventricle pumps this oxygen-poor blood through the pulmonary arteries to the gas exchange surfaces of the lungs to pick up oxygen and eliminate carbon dioxide. The oxygenated blood then returns to the left side of the heart. The systemic circuit begins when the left atrium receives oxygen-rich blood returning from the lungs through the pulmonary veins. The left ventricle pumps this blood into the aorta for distribution to the tissues and organs. Let's take a look at how your heart beats. The heartbeat relies on the coordinated contraction of cardiac muscle cells. The cardiac cycle refers to the sequence of events as the heart beats. It includes periods of contraction called systole and periods of relaxation called diastole. Heart valves prevent backflow of blood during ventricular systole and ventricular diastole. Now let's take a look at a single valve and how it works. Valves are flaps of connective tissue anchored by strong threads. They open and close to direct blood flow. The movement of blood depends on pressure gradients. For example, blood will flow from one heart chamber to another whenever the fluid pressure in the first chamber is greater than that in the second chamber. When pressure in an atrium is higher than in the attached ventricle as it is during a ventricular diastole, the atrium contracts, fluid pressure increases inside the chamber, and blood flows into the ventricle at an accelerated rate. Pressure rises in the ventricle as it fills. Ventricular pressures rise quickly as ventricular systole occurs. When pressure in the ventricle exceeds that of the atrium, blood moving toward the atrium pushes the valve closed. So far, we've learned two important concepts. Blood flow through the heart depends on fluid pressure, and valves prevent backward flow of the blood. Notice how the valves work as we follow the steps of the cardiac cycle. The cycle starts with atrial systole. Elevated fluid pressure in the contracting atria forces additional blood into the relaxed ventricles, completely filling them. The atria then enter a period of relaxation, which lasts for the remainder of the cardiac cycle. As atrial systole ends, ventricular systole begins. As the ventricles begin to contract, fluid pressure inside them builds. When ventricular pressures rise above those in the atria, the atrioventricular valves swing shut. When right ventricular pressure exceeds pressure in the pulmonary trunk, the pulmonary semilunar valve opens and blood flows into the pulmonary circuit. When the left ventricular pressure exceeds aortic pressure, the aortic semilunar valve opens and blood rushes into the aorta. Ventricular diastole then begins and ventricular pressures decline. As ventricular pressures fall below pulmonary and aortic pressures, the semilunar valves close. The cardiac cycle ends with both the atria and ventricles in diastole. So the next time you're exercising and you sense your heart rate climbing, be aware that the cardiac cycle with its alternating periods of systole and diastole is in a constant repeat mode to keep your blood flowing and your body operating smoothly. Hi, I'm Suzanne Savoy, and I'll be your host for the video tutor discussion of the immune response. 
Our body is prepared to defend itself with both nonspecific and specific mechanisms. Nonspecific defenses prevent infectious organisms or hazardous materials from entering the body or limit their spread within our tissues. The skin, for example, contains several nonspecific defenses. It forms a tough protective shield against bacteria and viruses. Your skin also has chemical defenses. Acids and destructive enzymes in your sweat and oil gland secretions inhibit the growth of microorganisms. Inside the body, other nonspecific defense mechanisms help prevent an infection from spreading. Beneath the epithelium, phagocytic cells such as macrophages engulf and destroy pathogenic organisms. These natural killer cells recognize and destroy abnormal body cells in a process called immunological surveillance. The complement system, another nonspecific defense mechanism, is a network of antimicrobial proteins that augment antibody action. When activated, these proteins stimulate inflammation, attract phagocytes, and bind to target organisms, making it easier for phagocytes to engulf them. Inflammation is a localized response to injury or infection. Chemicals released by mast cells initiate a variety of responses that restrict the spread of infection and facilitate tissue repair. The elevated temperature of a fever can facilitate body defenses by speeding up cell metabolism. Sometimes, nonspecific defenses aren't destructive enough to stop the spread of an invader. In that case, your body initiates a highly focused counterattack using specific defense mechanisms. Specific defenses are similar to the popular game paintball, where two different teams are represented by the colors blue and red. The blue represents the good team, your body's defenses. The red represents the attackers, such as infectious organisms or foreign proteins. Just like the attacking paintball team wears red bandanas, and our defensive team wears blue, our body cells have their own identifying markers called MHC proteins. The immune response is programmed to attack and destroy any cell or large molecule that doesn't have the correct identifiers. Molecules or cells that trigger an immune response are called antigens. Just as our paint teams have divided up their defensive responsibilities, the specific defense mechanism has two methods of attack the cell-mediated and antibody-mediated responses. Both react to antigens, which are foreign cells or molecules that trigger an immune response. Both types of immune responses involve specialized white blood cells called lymphocytes. All of your lymphocytes originate from stem cells in the bone marrow.